is a live picture of the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It is a record setter on Wall Street. The Dow Jones Industrial Average on track to close above another all-time high, above the 13,000 mark in a big way with a gain of 112 points. We are entering the final and most important hour of the trading day. This is it. We will see if we close above that level. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the closing bell. I'm Maria Bartiromo coming to you today live from the Milken Institute Global Conference here in Los Angeles, where hundreds of billions of dollars is represented by state treasurers here talking about how to allocate that money in the face of Dow 13,000. Dylan. And good afternoon to you, Marie. Speaking of hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions crossing in markets here at 13,000 on the Dow. Why is that, you ask? Durable goods, better than expected. Earnings consistently better than expected, not just for the Dow names, not even for just the exchange names. Amazon.com with its single best day in more than six years' time, the stock up 20% on the day. Across the board, earnings coming in ahead of expectations. The economy appears, appears at this point to have a more robust support practice, basically, whether it's the economic data or the earnings supporting it. That's why you have the behavior you have in the stock market today. Alcoa, also sensational, looking to sell their Reynolds wrap, uh, and that has a stock up 4% on the day. That's a big move for a name like Alcoa, and that's part of the reason the Dow looks as good as it does over 20, with 23 of the 30 Dow names higher today. Tech stocks continue to perform even after the chip names ran Biggest rally yesterday in seven months in the chip stocks. They're up again today. Take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You'll see precisely what it is that I am speaking of. 118 points right now. The advance on the Dow as momentum picks up into the afternoon. Dow right now at 13,072. This keeps up. You'll do 13,100 before the day is over. NASDAQ continues to perform reasonably well. Again, doesn't have as much momentum uh, as the Dow does, but it, Amazon certainly working to its benefit along with the tech stocks, S&P 500 across the board benefiting from the breadth of this rally at this hour. Maria. Well, you know, it's only a round number, 13,000, but let's put it into some perspective today for the blue chips. It took only 127 trading days, 127 trading days to go from 12,000 to 13,000. Compare that to seven and a half years that it took to get from 11,000 to 12,000. What does that say about the health of the current market? We find out now from our team covering the markets. Bob Pisani at the NYSC, the NASDAQ, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and the NYMEX. All oh, we got you covered, as well as our special guest. Bob, kick us off our eye on the floor of the exchange. And the important thing, Maria, is not just the Dow 30 stocks hitting new highs. We're seeing the, the transportation stocks hitting new highs, the utilities, and the mid-cap index, which is a much broader index than the Dow Jones Industrial Average, all hitting historic highs. The one thing that is curious about this rally here is the buying enthusiasm remains modest. What does that mean? It means that you'd think that people would be piling in a little more and the volume would be moving up, but it's really not. Instead, the sellers are being more tight-fisted. Selling prices have to rise to meet the modest buyers that are out there. Still, that's new high. And it's very simple. Earnings are coming in better than anticipated, and the buybacks have been exceptionally strong, even stronger than we've been telling you about in the prior six months. I want to highlight a couple of groups that are really moving strongly today. We're strong across the mark board, particularly cyclical stocks. But take a look at energy stocks in general here today. They're the real market leaders right now. You've got stocks, and I'm talking right across the board here, no matter what sector, oil service. You can look at some of the small uh, oil companies like Marathon, uh, National Oil Well, Transocean in the oil service service group. All of them are exceptionally strong. We're seeing oil moving towards $66 here today. And when I ask people what could possibly slow the market down, uh, the most common response is either oil over $70, dramatically over $70, or some kind of international incident or crisis. The other sector moving very strongly today are material stocks. And of course, Alcoa has been a big help, as you heard from Dylan there. They're looking for strategic alternatives for maybe getting rid of their packaging and consumer unit. Of course, that's Reynolds. That's about 6% of their income, 10% of their revenues uh, overall here. And that was a surprise to the market, really helped put the Dow, Dow over 13,000 earlier on. But Vulcan, U.S. Steel, uh, some of the, uh, the chemical companies uh, like Eastman and Air Products, all are notably stronger. Those are pretty big numbers here for those particular chemical companies. Finally, I want to note UPS here, which became the poster boy today of the very typical comments that we have been seeing. Uh, the CFO out this morning talking about the sluggish U.S. economy, saying it could be this way for a couple more quarters. And yet, when specifically asked about the sluggish U.S. volume growth, talked about the possibility that this quarter could be the bottom 
of that. Now that is why we're seeing that stock move up. In fact, we're seeing really nice moves up today in the transportation stocks, as I mentioned, historic high there. So let's go Scott Wapner standing by at the NASDAQ. All right, Bob, thanks so much. We've been on a bit of a run over the last hour or so. NASDAQ now trading at a six-year high. Some of that earlier weakness that I talked about in the semiconductors, that has dissipated. So for the second straight day, the semiconductor stocks are strong when they turned around. That's the reason we continue to go on this run here up on the intraday chart to where we sit now, up 1%. But let's talk about Amazon. Clearly the story of the day. Look what the stock is doing. Up 26%. It easily beat the street. Also raised its guidance. Upgraded by a number of firms. And check out these facts. Hasn't been this high since July of 2004. It is also the highest daily percentage gain since 2002. The fourth biggest daily percentage gain ever for Amazon.com. Sun Microsystems, meantime, not helping technology out today. In fact, it's going the opposite direction, down just about 12%. The revenues missed expectations. So the concern now, does that mean there's going to be a slowdown in Sun's core server business? That's what Wall Street is worried about, sending those shares down almost 12% today. Apple, meantime, a nice lift ahead of the earnings after the bell, up almost 2%. Keep an eye on those numbers coming out just after the bell. In fact, let's take a look at some of the earnings movers today, some of the stocks ups and downs throughout the day today, because there are a lot of earnings stories, of course. Take a look at these. UAL there down at the bottom. The parent of United Airlines, they posted a loss for the quarter of $152 million. At the top, there's been a lot of talk about a casual restaurants. Cheesecake Factory you're looking at right now, they came in in line. KeyBank also upgraded the stock. But the story today, right here, Amazon.com up 26% helping the NASDAQ to a 1% gain. Dylan? All right. The Fed also out with its latest beige book. Let's find out what bond investors are saying. Rick Santelli in Chicago with the bond report. Rick. Well, you know, Dylan, of course, equity traders want to look for anything positive in the beige book. That one would downgrade growth a bit or possibly downgrade inflation. Why? We know why. They would rather have the Fed talking more about the possibility of easing. But the reality showed up in Treasuries. At 2 Eastern, they didn't move much. There was nothing really new in the beige book. We had pretty strong, durable goods. That the housing number, well, it was a lot different than yesterday's existing home sales, even though some may have been disappointed. Look at two-month charts. First, two-year notes. We auctioned them off today. Good auction, $18 billion. You can see from this chart, nothing extreme. But look at the next charts. And before you do think, if 5% dollar weakness sometimes means 5% gains in dollar-denominated commodities, let's think stocks here. Now, if you look at the dollar index over the last two months, it's gone from 84 down to 81 and a half. What did the S&P futures do? They basically moved from 14 to 15. Now, granted, there's a lot more going on than just the dollar. Of course, there's the multinational effects, but all things being equal, that's a relationship to pay attention to. Now, let's go to Rebecca Jarvis at the NYMEX. Thanks, Rick. Well, you saw a rally in equities today. You're also seeing a rally here at the NYMEX in energy stocks. Crude rallying up more than a dollar today on inventory data. Very bullish for gasoline on a large large unexpected increase, uh, a decrease, I should say, in gasoline stocks, uh, making it the 11th straight week of drawdowns. There also a decrease in refinery runs, plus more refinery outages we're hearing about. Also, the CEO of ConocoPhillips, you remember those comments where he said that this summer season looks like there might not be enough fuel to meet demand. Also on the crude front, closing at $65.84 in spite of very bearish data there, up 2.1 million barrels uh, on the inventory data there. Also, you see the same thing in heating oil up almost 3% today in spite of the fact that that was a very little changed uh, number on the inventory front. We'll get in information tomorrow on the storage report on natural gas. You did see a slight pickup in it later in the day today. But right now, the traders here are really focusing, Maria, on the Mets game. Back to you. All right. Well, we're focusing on earnings and what's behind this market rally. Optimism about corporate earnings is part of what's driving the rally today on Wall Street. And definitely that optimism you talk about, Rebecca, in terms of where we stand in the first quarter so far. Take a look at this. As of this morning, 219 S&P 500 companies have reported their first quarter results. Earnings have come in 6.2 percent above analyst expectations. Now, so far, we're seeing earnings growth of more than 6% versus the same quarter a year ago. That's much better than what we saw last week when the quarter's uh, earnings uh, reports were just beginning to flow out. Finally, among the S&P 500 companies that have reported so far, a full 69% have beaten the expectations. 16% reported results in line 
and only 15 percent have so far missed expectations. So overall, Dylan, it looks like corporate America is doing better than what many were expecting in the quarter. And of course, those expectations have been lowered. And certainly well-managed expectations. Uh, they, they, they set it up uh, and, they, and they beat it. It's that simple. The final hour of the trading day, we're on track for our first ever close above 13,000, first ever time above 13,000. Where do we go from here and, and how do you put fresh money into a market going into the summer at these relatively high or never seen levels? Maybe they're high, maybe they're not. That's the debate. Alec Young, equity market strategist at Standard & Poor's uh, with me right here in the balcony. And, and Alec, first of all, we know this is a signpost and, and all, all the rest of it, but how does it mark out for you, uh, your decision-making process? Are you pleased with how you set up going into it and how do you adjust coming out of it? Yeah, we think the momentum in the market is looking really good. I mean, we know earnings growth is, is slowing a little bit from the pace of the last few years, but nevertheless, the market was priced for 3% earnings growth this quarter. We're coming in at double that rate at 6%. There's a lot of negative sentiment in the market, high short interest. All of these things kind of set the market up to go higher, we think. Where did we think the economy was going to be weak and where were we wrong? In other words, there was an expectation for, for a relative weakening in the economy. Obviously, it didn't get as weak as we thought it was going to be. Where were we wrong in our right. expectations? Well, yeah, the market definitely priced in one big theme earlier in the year, and that was a slowing economy. And so today's news on durable goods coming in well ahead of expectations. When the market had priced in a slowdown, it's being positively surprised. That's good news. But even when we get bad news on the housing front, like we did yesterday, the market's able to look through it. Why? We think because the market's already discounted. A lot of the bad news is in the market. And so when we get good news, it's just fuel to the upside. Is it as, as simple as the earnings and economy story for the run? And particularly if you look at, for the, forget 13,000 for a second, if you can, 15 of the past 17 days, I think it is, maybe 14 of the past 17 days, the stock market has been up. The momentum in general has been tremendous and broadening. Drug stocks catching up, technology stocks, sensational, yeah. haven't been performing. Am I better to chase those names or, or go with what's been working? We think overall, uh, you know, the, the better economic news and the better earnings news is to a large extent what's driving the market. But those are two pretty big factors. Those are arguably two, two of the most the important factors, sure. factors. In terms of where to look, we like healthcare. We're recommending overweighting that. And financials, you know, as the, as the economic story, the subprime situation plays out a little better than people expect, we think there's room for financials to start outperforming. They've kind of lagged year to date. Financials, forget lag was the worst performing sector of the first quarter. It was sure. miserable yeah. on a relative basis. Yeah. Yeah. It, however, did pick up momentum going to the back to the beginning of last week. If you were going to put a financial position on, where, where would you, how would you put it on? Well, one of the areas we like is investment banking and brokerage. So Goldman Sachs got a strong buy there. We really like that name. People keep betting against these stocks. They trade at very low multiples. They keep thinking that the Wall Street... the volatility Street, is supposed to be too high for them. That, the reason well, for the rationalization for the low multiple is they're unpredictable, yeah. and yet yeah. they continue to well, make money. Well, and, and that the volatility is going to go up, but it doesn't. You know, the fundamentals are very good. We think they're still being underestimated. The global M&A continues to be strong. Capital markets continue to be strong. They keep pricing these stocks for some kind of a big crash. We don't see it coming. We think you can still play the investment banks and brokers. Alec, it's a pleasure. Thanks for spending some time How in the balcony going? with us here at the exchange. Uh, we'll looking at just over 45 minutes to wrap up what is setting up to be a historic trading day. Dow Jones Industrial Average now comfortably above the 13,000 mark. The NASDAQ, a 25-point advancer led by the chip stocks and a 20% advance in Amazon.com. Maria. Well, we're looking at the hundreds of billions of dollars at work and the big money view on the strength of the recent market rally. I'll be talking with the chief investment strategist of two of the nation's largest pension funds. My guest here at the Milken Conference coming up. And then picture this, big gains ahead for shares of Kodak. Spectacular performance in that stock of late, believe it or not. At least that's what Pete Nigerian is arguing for its future. He says the options market predicts it. The Fast Money Gang talking Kodak just ahead. We've got to end up with a higher quality workforce than we have today, and education's the only way to get there. And then billionaire Eli Broad announcing a major education plan to keep America competitive. We'll have more from my interview with Mr. Broad. We'll tell you which other billionaire is joining the fight. But first, the most active names right here at the New York Stock Exchange, led by Pfizer, Motorola, which may take Carl Icahn onto its board after all. Corning, out with earnings, GE, Advanced Micro, all continue to perform on a Wednesday afternoon. You're watching Closing Bell on CNBC, America's business channel.
Welcome back to the closing bell. Let's get now the big money view on the market's record run today from the nation's top pension fund chiefs. Russell Reed, chief investment officer for the California Public Employees Retirement System with me, along with Christopher Ailman. He is chief investment officer at the California State Teachers Retirement System. Combined, they manage more than $400 billion, and we welcome you to the program, gentlemen. Thank you. Great nice to, be to here. have you with, uh, with us today. So, uh, you've got, Russell, $241 billion under management, and Chris, you've got $165 billion under management. When you see a market uh, like we're seeing today with the Dow up 100 plus points, what do you think about? I mean, are you thinking about putting money to work? Are you thinking about taking chips off the table? What are you doing? Well, I think there are two pieces to this. You know, for us, on the one hand, it's a nice time, time to take some chips off the table, but it's also a good time to reevaluate what's going on. We think there are tremendous opportunities in the capital markets, not only in the U.S., but outside of the U.S., but we think finding those opportunities is going to be shifting potentially pretty dramatically. In particular, we think that there's going to be a fundamental shift in what constitutes uh, growth versus value in, among many companies. So we, we've gotten used to knowing what growth versus value meant. Um, growth companies were, were technology companies and healthcare companies and, and value companies were where uh, we're energy companies, materials companies, right. a lot of that could shift because the needs for capital are going to shift in the U.S. and particularly as we go to Asia. Chris, what do you think? We're cautious, cautiously optimistic like Russell, but I'm actually taking profits. We're paring back our U.S. equity exposure. We've been long U.S. equity and non-U.S. equity for about 18 months, made a ton of money from that. And so with this market up this strong, I want to take a little bit of money off that table and try and find cheaper assets around the world. And with all the money you, you are overseeing, what are you up today? What, like a billion dollars or something? Probably in our case up a billion. Russell's probably up about two billion just in a day. Just in a day. This is a good day. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's a good day. Go two billion dollars. Pretty sweet there. You're taking chips off the table in the U.S., Chris, but do you allocate it differently around the world? How, how do you compare U.S. equities from international markets today? We've actually been overweight non-U.S. equities most of the last two years. We love them, and, and both of us have exposure to the developed markets and the emerging markets. But what we've actually been doing is kind of equally depending when the markets have updates like this, like Japan was down today, but the U.S. is up. We're going to take profits in the U.S. where we can. Then we'll shift after this and take profits in non-U.S. I like non-dollar assets, but I want to take money away from those. Both of us as long-term investors want to rebalance, and this is a chance to do that. I, th I think one of the bigger shifts that we're anticipating also is really the shift toward emerging markets. You know, emerging markets are important to us, but they still only represent a few percent of our overall portfolios. What we're seeing going forward is really the importance, uh, the centrality of succeeding in the emerging markets. For 50 years after World War II, the emerging markets themselves weren't really central to our success. Going forward, we think they really are. So how do you uh, make that play in emerging markets? I mean, are you looking at uh, certain sectors like, you know, here at the conference, a lot of buzz about financial services. When you look at the emerging markets, you're seeing tremendous growth there. And when you see the population growth, all those people are going to need all sorts of financial services products. Is that how you play it? Or is it infrastructure, energy, or what? I think you hit on the latter. I was impressed by a panel you led today and the one yesterday. The energy needs for China are just staggering. Um, and it's not just their energy needs because they've got, they've got access to coal, but it's all that infrastructure. And so both of us have talked a lot of times about infrastructure, energy infrastructure, even with our economy as we convert away from hydrocarbons into other fuels. We need that infrastructure, and that's a good long-term investment we can make money from. Well, energy, I mean, just is not going away. Everybody's talking about energy as a, as a huge investment idea. What about you, Russell? Uh, what, how are you playing that emerging market growth? Well, it's really across the board. You know, the energy piece is a big deal. We're seeing capital requirements for both liquid fuel and for power generation to be $20 trillion worldwide over the next 25 years. That's a big number. And you know, meeting that need, uh, not only in the U.S., but particularly in the Asian markets, is going to be a big challenge. A lot of need for capital, a lot of opportunity. It's going to be in, in, in the liquid markets, in public equities and fixed income, but also in places like real estate, uh, private equity, uh, infrastructure is certainly a big deal to us. Okay, take me back to the U.S. right now and tell me, you, you're both basically a little cautious. You want to be taking chips off the table in a market that has the Dow Jones Industrial Average at an all-time high. Do you think that this... This move then will reverse. Are you looking for a sell-off at some point, profit-taking for the broader market? I mean, obviously, you must not think that this is a sustainable and sort of an accelerated move upwards. Otherwise, you wouldn't be taking money off the table. Well, I want to clarify. We're still long the U.S. equity market. 42% of our funds exposed to U.S. stocks. So I'm still bullish on stocks. 
but this run-up has been so strong over the last 18 months that I right. want to take some money off of that. You got to sell selling? high. Where are you selling? We're selling across the whole portfolio. Um, for us, both of us own the entire U.S. equity market. We've got 2,800 stocks. So when I'm selling, it is large cap to small caps, the whole Russell 3000. Um, but I'm trying to figure out what's cheap in the world that we can look around and reinvest that money in. Same thing, Russell? Yeah, it's really the uh, it, it, very similar percentages, and I think that, that the next story is likely to be a rotation among the values within the stock market rather than the stock market going up all going up um, uh, like we've seen from right. that 12,000 to 13,000 level. All right, we'll leave it there. Gentlemen, it's so nice to have you on the program. That's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Chris Elman and Russell Reed. Still to come here on The Closing Bell, we are watching this market. Dow 13,000. The trader track, the Dow finally uh, breaking that mark. Up next, we'll get first hand info on how traders are positioning themselves. How can you learn from their strategy? Back in a moment. Welcome back to the floor of the exchange. A historic day. Dow well, well above 13,000 at this point. All the economic data looks good at this point. Most of the earnings data looks good at this point. Stephen Porporo uh, with us here on the floor. Managing floor broker William O'Neill. Bob Pisani, you know and love. Striped shirt, striped tie, striped suit. Looking good. Get away with that these days. It's, it's, uh, yes, you can. I'll start with you, Stephen. Uh, the first thought that goes through your head as you digest the momentum that, that, that today is the culmination of, but we had a, a heck of a run getting here. Heck of a run and broadly based is, is the thing that sticks in my head most. If you look at, I saw the statistic, 81% of all New York Stock Exchange stocks are well above their 200 day moving average. Vast decline lines, reaching near highs. This is a broadly based move here. Simple case of underestimating the economy, Bob? No, I don't think the U.S. economy is being underestimated. I think they underestimated the global economy because the earnings contribution seems to be most pronounced coming from the international side of the thing. And of course, remember, the weak dollar is helping as well. You see a slowdown in the international side, I think you'll see more problems. But right now, clearly, overseas outperforming the U.S. The markets, the indices are here in the U.S. are global, not well, U.S. The laggards are starting to show up. Drug stocks, tech stocks, the financials, which are miserable in the first quarter. Yeah, they had a rough time. They're starting to look a little bit better. But there again, broadly based. There certainly are groups that are leading here. However, this market is dragging everybody along with it. And that's what you want to see as you move to new highs. But as you say, the names are getting dragged, Bob Pisani. Are, are people more interested in looking for the, game, the names playing catch up, like the sectors we just talked about, or the names that already had the momentum? Well, I think you're going to look for, at this point, we're seeing the ones that are lagging are the defensive names right now. So healthcare had a great run earlier on as Merck and Shearing and Lilly had great earnings reports. Today we're seeing as oil gets 66, the energy stocks are getting bought rather aggressively. The material stocks are being bought rather aggressively as well on the global economic expansion. At this stock, at this point, I'm not sure what kind of sectors there are out there that are noticeably lagging. They're just rotating in and out in the last several weeks. I agree it's a broad-based rally. I want to particularly know the, the, the mid-cap index is at a historic high. That's where you get all those oil service stocks, all those stocks that you trade every day that are right in the middle like Marathon Oil. Those are the ones that are really moving nicely right now. Yeah, yeah the mid-caps led for a while. Actually, they, the Russell just made a new high today, too. So there, again, we're dragging along. The housing stocks would be one we would look at. Well, even Very they started to turn, they've been told brothers they're yes. starting to perform. Yes, they gave us a couple of little head fakes earlier in the year, but they're starting to perform here. Interesting to watch. Very quickly from both of you, because we've got to get out of here, but there's a lot of ground between here and the close Friday afternoon. The GDP report, Exxon earnings, Microsoft earnings, Apple earnings, the list goes on. How confident are you between now and Friday at 4 o'clock, Steve? Well, I think we've got, the, again, the momentum issue here and the broadness of it. I'm pretty confident. We're a little overboard here. We could get a little pullback. It might even be an inner day one. Right. I think the market's going higher. What do you We're say, seeing boss? clear. The trend is clear for the earnings. U.S. a bit slow. International is terrific. S&P 1327. That's the number that matters. 1527. That's the old, excuse me. Thank God you. 1527. That's the old close. 1327 will be ahead of That is not a too. good thing. We'll all be down. <laughs> on down over there. <laughs> Thank you very Back. much. Uh, Maria. All right, Dylan, well, the Dow might be hitting a key psychological mark today, but if history shows, we could be poised for even more gains in the short term. Bob O'Brien explains. Indeed, Maria, the, uh, the Dow does have a, a very pronounced tendency when we cross these thresholds. For one thing, uh, the first influence is simply mathematical. As the market moves higher, each of the subsequent moves on the part of the Dow becomes smaller. From 13 to 14,000 will be a move of just 7.7%. 7 .7 
compared with the previous milestone, which was about 8.5%. Under that scenario, we could see the market eclipse 14,000 sometime around September. Now, take a look. There is a very pronounced pattern here that's taken place over the course of the last, uh, over the last several years. In that pattern, what we typically see is markets really rallying on a short-term basis. And according to Spencer Jacob, a columnist with the, uh, with the Dow Jones Newswires, we could, in fact, see the market move to uh, 100,000 on the Dow by 2035. Now, a lot of things have to happen. Keep in mind, here in this period, we saw, uh, we saw as many as seven milestones broken in a four-year period. But it's been seven years uh, it, it took seven years for the Dow to go from 11,000 to 12,000, obviously just six months. So we seem to have reaccelerated that pace under those circumstances, then we could presumably be at 100,000 in 2035. Maria, will we still be sitting down on the closing <laughs> bell then? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. Get the Dow Jones Industrial Average up in the triple digits. And in the last hour, we are looking at an acceleration of that move. NASDAQ also higher today, and we've got just a few minutes before the closing bell. And with Dylan. the, oh yeah, Maria, with the Dow at 13,000, we're talking to one investor with $11 billion under his belt. What's he doing with the money as the market gets even more attention now, thanks to the big round number? And then in today's Fast Money final call, Eric Bowling says refiners are still the way to go, even after the tremendous run they've had through the spring. We'll talk to him and Pete Nigerian in the final call coming up. CNBC is Earning Central. Get up to the minute reports first and fast, on air and online. All earnings season long on CNBC. NASDAQ. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Closing Bell. I'm Maria Bartiromo reporting live today from the Milken Institute Global Conference in Los Angeles. Dylan. Hi, Maria. Good afternoon to you. I am Dylan Radigan. We're here at the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, a little less than 30 minutes left until the closing bell rings and the market shapes up in record form. Dow Jones Industrial Average. Look at this momentum, Maria, as the afternoon wears on. We're now 13,100, up 146 points on the day. Alcoa, a spectacular performer, but almost every single sector, both those that lagged, again, technology, financials, and drugs, and those that have led, energy, materials, industrials, multinationals, now all sinking up. And as a result, you have a market that looks like this, 13,100. To the NASDAQ we go. It holds on to that 25-point advance, 2549. And as Bob Pisani likes to point out, all eyes now turn to the S&P 500 and whether it can break through a new record. It still has a bit of ground to cover, 1527, the magic number for it. So you got another 30 points to do it. Maria. Yeah, it's been a pretty good uh, final hour so far. We've got about 30 minutes left in the trading day right now and the Dow is certainly holding steady has been accelerating actually now with that 147 point move joining me here at the Milken Institute conference to talk about where the money is moving is Todd Bowley he's managing partner at Guggenheim Partners nice to have you with us Todd welcome now you are looking at 11 billion dollars uh, under men there's, there's good value there and the question is really about well what are you going to do in the future with these companies that you buy today and I think you know the public markets are um, you know, there's a very nice bid in the back for, for background with the private equity capital, and you have the credit markets that are enabling all this. Look, the credit markets have been enabling this with easy money, and that obviously the accommodative situation has been enabling all the deal flow and thus the liquidity in this market. What, in your view, turns the spigot off or changes the situation? Well, you know, that is the million-dollar question. Yes, it and, is. Uh, you know, I think ultimately, you know, the things I'm worried about are, you know, currency risk. You know, the currency continues to devalue against other currencies. And ultimately, the question is, you know, do people want dollars? You know, and I think ultimately, you know, that's one of the concerns. And then you obviously have all the geopolitical risks, which, you know, it's a word that people use. I'm not quite sure what it means. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's, a, you know, captured in the term event risk. You know, what's going to happen with yeah, the next stuff event? stuff you really can't control, obviously. Correct. You mentioned the dollar. Obviously, the dollar has been weak. How do you invest or make money on that situation? Well, I think you continue to figure out, you know, where the growth opportunities are outside of the U.S., and then hopefully you get a double whammy by having the dollar when you actually bring it back to the U.S., 
you have the benefit of having a you know, further sliding dollar. So you find good, unique opportunities overseas, and then hopefully you know, when you come back, you've also made money on the currency. So, so what's your uh, recommended portfolio today? Tell me, uh, within fixed income, what are you betting on? And, and within equities, where do you want to be really placing your bets? Well, I think we're very industry specific. So you know, industries that we continue to see good opportunities in. You know, our energy, uh, I think, you know, the, the going green, I don't think that's a trend that's going to go away anytime soon. Um, and with the hedging markets in energy, you can buy assets and lock in cash flows for a very long time, which you used to not be able to do. So, you know, I think energy is definitely something that we spend a lot of time with. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, other industries where there's opportunity, uh, I think, you know, continues to be interesting opportunities in media. Media is continuing to develop, so we're spending a lot of time there. And then, you know, retail is something that we like, too. Think this market sustains these gains and goes higher? Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's no reason that it doesn't. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think yes is the answer. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it on a yes, Todd. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Todd Bowley is managing partner at Guggenheim Partners, $11 billion AUM. Up next on the closing bell, it took only 127 days for the data to go from 12 to 13,000. Up next, we'll play which stocks could have could have even more legs to run. Back in a moment. You're watching Closing Bell on CNBC, America's business channel. good bumps. Welcome back to the closing bell, everybody. We continue our focus on the market rallying into record territory today with a look now at one of the drivers of the market resiliency, the global private equity business. Yesterday, I moderated a panel here at the Milken Institute called the State of Private Equity 2007. I had all the big hitters in the business on that panel with me. David Bonderman, co-founder of Texas Pacific Group, TPG. David Rubenstein, co-founder of the Carlyle Group. Tom Lee, a founder of Thomas H. Lee Capital, and Leon Black of Apollo Group. They, of course, have been putting money to work in a big way in terms of deals. Out of the nearly $700 billion in private equity deals in the last two years, the biggest targeted industries have been media and entertainment, followed by high tech and real estate. Now, the captains of industry also agreed and told me that these are the best of times, that, that things cannot possibly get much better from here. But they stopped short of predicting lower returns. Here's what they said. As expected, they said the most important driver of their business today and the ability to do deals is the accommodative credit markets, as well as the very important banks that the bank syndicate loans, that the banks are offloading the collateralized loan obligations. And that was very key to them. Some of them actually said this is a warning sign. They said these are risky structured products, especially with what's happening in subprime right now. Now, going forward, they all agreed that the opportunities for deals is definitely global. And that includes the U.S. David Bonderman said that in 1994, 86% of the deals he was seeing were in the United States. In 2005, it was 45% worldwide, with a full 26% in Europe. Leon Black said that in 1997, 5% of the deals he was watching and his deals were outside the U.S. And in 2005, it was a full 40%. Now, they all spoke of opportunities in the geographies seeing the fastest growth, faster certainly than the United States. That includes emerging markets, China, India, Africa, and really throughout Asia, Europe as well. Although Rubenstein, Debbie Rubenstein, said that the biggest bang for him is in the United States. The companies that need restructuring, that's where he says you're going to make the most money. As for themes, they said macro themes work. Like the growth of those nations comes the insatiable demand out of those nations for energy. Also, a construction boom going on as those nations grow. Infrastructure is in going to continue to be big. The demand for commodities. And, of course, in the United States and in Europe, the more developed areas, companies with consistent cash flow. I asked them how the deal size changes when and if they all go public. <laughs> it was interesting because at one point someone said, oh, it's the elephant in the room. Leon Black is going public next week. I said, are you? He said, absolutely not. I'm not announcing that next week. 
But they did say that having a public stock as a currency will enable them to get bigger. In other words, make acquisitions in specialized areas. That's why it's going to be a positive. They said it's also a good way to pay people, retaining talent with that currency. Talent was a big issue. All of them talked about that. And when I asked whether going public means that it's a top in this market, of course, that's what everybody is talking about, they said, well, why don't you just go look at Goldman Sachs? When Goldman Sachs went public a couple of years ago, everybody was saying the same thing. Today, the stock is four times the size of the IPO. Well, those are some of the themes I picked up from the private equity guys here at the Milken Conference last night, Dylan. All right, good stuff, Maria. Uh, time now for the Fast Money Final Call. Looking ahead to Dow 14,000 or back at Dow 12,000. Which companies lead the way? Which ones could fall apart? Fast Money's Eric Bowling, fresh off the floor of the NYMEX. Option Monster trader Pete Nigerian, also the co-founder over there. Eric, I'll start things, or Pete, excuse me, I'll start things off with you. You believe that there's a lot of action in Kodak right now. Uh, we're going to get to Alcoa, which is the Dow component, in just a second. Why do you see the Kodak momentum? Well, the interesting thing today, Dylan, quite frankly, actually it started a week ago on Monday. May quarter calls were bought for 40 cents. A lot of speculative paper coming in there. These are the options. The right to buy the stock at $25. Stock absolutely rocketed up and through $26 today. Those calls went to over $2. Then they started buying the May 27 and a half calls, the June 25 calls. So a lot of activity in an Eastman Kodak stock that's up over 10%. If you look at the explosion uh, across the board uh, in Kodak, real quick, Pete, would you fall? Would you do you chase it now, or is it, have we missed it? Well, um, I would have said you look like you're chasing it, but right now, as they've shifted to those May 27 and a half calls, there seems to be something more underlying that none of us are aware of just yet. But the May 27 and a half calls, Dylan, they had an open interest of under 200 contracts. 6,000 plus have traded today, so certainly the speculative paper is coming out and yeah. they're starting to look for more upside. Eric, the refiners, you called it on this show months ago. It's been a sensational call for you. They've been, they have exploded as well. Uh, you still like them. Well, you know what happened today, Dylan? I'm watching the screen and they're about flat, maybe a little higher. All of a sudden, 1030 API DOE releases their figures, refinery utilization down 2.5%. Now, I know that made gasoline go up, but what really did is help everyone who's a trader who trades these refinery stocks realizes that gasoline prices aren't coming down for a really, really long time, and that's a lot of profit into these refineries. And that, by the way, was the reason for the 7%, not year to date, but 1030 till now, right. rise in in uh, Tesoro and a 5% in Frontier and in some of the others, 3 and 5%. Real quick from both of you, because I've got you here. You've both seen a lot of uh, records come and go. Uh, this one, the latest to fall, Dow 13,000. Uh, the most interesting trade when, you, when the euphoria of a, of a psychological number uh, comes in. Pete, you first. Well, it is just psychological. That's the thing that's most important here. This is not a technical breakout. It's a psychological number. And the fact that we're up through 13,000, I think it's terrific. But I don't think we should make such a big deal out of it. I think the important thing here is the impressive earnings from multiple sectors across the board, Dylan. That's what's impressive. Uh, Eric, real quick, two cents from you. Two cents is that the, the record 13,000 wasn't the real headline. The real headline was a new low in the dollar, and that's put some real upside into multinationals, commodity-based companies, and something no one spoke about today, that travel and leisure group. Those hotels are going to see some serious upside. Those strong yeah. euros, people are going to come over here and spend some euro dollars, turn them into dollars. It's a cheap vacation for them. They'll see upside. Morgan's Hotel Group, keep your eye on that one. And speaking of travel and leisure, uh, some leisure last night. There's a, a rock and roll band uh, you may have heard of called Fountains of Wayne. Take a look. They've got an interesting band member. You like that, Eric? It, Dylan, you're sporting those guns, man. Look at those guns. <laughs> Look at that Gord solo. Holy cow. Who's that other Gord guy? Get rid of that other Gord. Uh, it was a Gord, it was a Gord uh, they trio. Gorders? Is that what they're called? They Listen, I'm bringing the Gord back. Uh, you should. And get I, rid of that. And that was that other what, guy playing. What's what his name? Just, Justin Timberlake's bringing Justin Timberlake's bringing <laughs> sexy back. I'm bringing Gord back. <laughs> and tight T-shirts. <laughs> and, and tight T-shirts. Well, only when you're playing in a rock and roll band. That's only when it's allowed. That's right. Uh, Fast Money tonight, 8 o'clock, Dow 13,000. Everybody will be there. Uh, we'll get all your best trades off. A lot of ground to cover, too, between now and Friday. So there's plenty of trading. Again, Microsoft, Apple, ExxonMobil, the GDP number, all between the close today and the close.
close on Friday. Up next on the closing bell here, all eyes on Apple. It's after the bell today. The company reported its results. Jim Goldman, of course, has the preview. Yeah, Dylan, with so much focus on the stock options scandal at Apple, the company's second quarter earnings are getting lost in the noise. But iPod, Mac, and the latest on iPhone when we come back. Markets going. What's the next big thing in business? Top decision makers answer those questions. Maria Bartiromo reports from the Milken Institute Global Conference next on C. Welcome back, everybody. Apple Computer due out shortly with its latest earnings results, and it is a lot of activity around the stock recently. There's a lot riding on those numbers. Jim Goldman is joining us now with a look at what to expect from Apple. Jim. Hey, Maria, just about 40 minutes away now from Apple's second quarter earnings, and while this tends to be a quiet, uneventful period for the company, that's not the case this time around. Break and come back to you with the closing countdown. We are taking you to the end of the trading day on a record setter. And then after the bell, join us, billionaires Eli Broad and Bill Gates announcing a landmark education campaign. I'll be talking with Mr. Broad about his efforts to shore up America's schools, and I'll talk about where he's putting his billions right now. To the floor of the exchange, the Dow Jones Industrial Average will set a definitive record. We're not just teetering through 13,000. We're powering. No man through 13,000. No, this is, this is, this is a goodness. market with conviction. What's the story? Well, look, uh, I have talked to a lot of people who lost a lot of money in the last week and a half. They have lost a lot of money because they've done what they always done in the past, which is they read the earnings reports, they read what the CEOs were saying, they read about a sluggish economy, as the UPS CEOs, a CFO said today, and they have said, this does not look like great commentary to me overall. We're at an earnings trough. I'm not going to buy into the market. What they have failed to look at is how the world is changing. The increasingly global aspect uh, of the earnings picture, number one. Number two, the dramatically weak dollar and how much that is contributing to overall earnings. And number three, the dramatic buybacks and the increases in buybacks and share dividends and how that's contributing to the overall enthusiasm. In days past, it would have been perfectly logical for people to look at what the CEOs are saying and buy or sell on that. But it's bigger than that now. It's bigger than that because the global markets can contribute because the dollar is big and because buybacks make an issue. And I think that's why a lot of people are getting frustrated here. Just looking at weak U.S. growth, weak the sluggish U.S. economy isn't enough anymore. That's not stopping the stock market. How vulnerable are how vulnerable are we right now? I'll save that question for four o'clock. That's like a tease. We're there. Bell rings. This is the real story. Dow 13,000 in the books. First time ever. 13,088. Almost every sector in the stock market getting it done today as the bell rings and the closing bell continues right now with Maria Bartiromo. Hey, Robert, are you there? historic day on Wall Street today. A triple digit gain for the Dow Jones Industrial Average cracking the 13,000 mark for the blue chips. It is the first close above 13,000 as well. Better than expected economic data today. Earnings continuing to drive stocks higher as they are coming in better than lowered expectations. And we are setting the tone tonight for tomorrow. We've got earnings results coming your way. Apple computer just moments away. Keep it right here on Closing Bell for the numbers, instant analysis, and of course, investor reaction. Hi everybody, I'm Maria Bartiromo coming to you today live from the Milken Institute Global Conference here in Los Angeles where the stock market's historic advance, the Dow closing above 13,000, is certainly among the buzz here today. Allocating billions of dollars is what people are talking about today. And it's not just on Wall Street where they're finding opportunities, it is around the world. Out of the gate, the blue chips crossed the 13,000 mark today. That was less than six months since it first crossed the 12,000 mark on the Dow. The biggest driver on the industrial average today, Alcoa, rallying as much as 7% earlier in the session. 
The aluminum company saying it is exploring strategic alternatives for its consumer business. Strength in IBM once again. Exxon Mobil also strong and American Express also propelling the Dow Industrials tonight to new heights. Check out the NASDAQ. Tonight it is at a six-year high on the NASDAQ. Technology certainly among the winners on the street today. The NASDAQ finishing very close to uh, its uh, best levels of the afternoon with a gain of 1% at 2547. S&P 500 it all, is also at its highest level in about six and a half years with a gain on the session of 1%, 15 points higher at 1495. Today's rally coming in the face of higher energy prices meanwhile. Crude oil up more than a dollar a barrel, up 2% on the session at the close, finishing at $65.84 a barrel. In fact, it is not just the Dow. We have other records to tell you about, like the Dow Transportation Average and the Dow Utility Average. Russell 2000 Index also hitting an historic high today at 832. We have all the coverage tonight for you and analysis of today's Dow 13,000 market milestone. CBC's Bob Pisani, Rick Santelli, and market strategist Kevin Cronin and Sam Stovall will be along momentarily. We kick it off with Bob on Wall Street. And, of course, I'm here with Dylan. Thanks very much, Maria. And the key takeaway here from Dylan, I think that's got everybody talking, is the fact that we are hitting new highs despite admitted weakness in the U.S. economy by a whole host of CFOs and CEOs, including today the UPS CFO. It also speaks, though, to, uh, and, uh, and some will call it sandbagging. The expectations were set incredibly low for the first quarter. They managed them very well. In other words, the, the executive community managed expectations very well to the analyst community. The bar was set at 3%. Anything above 3% has been a winner. We've had a a lot of numbers well above 3%, so it creates the, rea the perception and the reality of a stronger economy than expected. You lay the durable goods on it today. You lay the performance of the non-performing sectors, drug stocks, financials. And, uh, I've been seeing this whole drugs and money trade. That thing picks up, and now you get uh, the, the market that and we have. And, of course, you've also got the, the dollar weakness, and you've got the huge amount of buybacks throwing it in. And we were just talking in the old days, it would have been rational for a person to stand back and say, listen, let's go back and let's just sell the market on this, but you don't need to do that anymore. That's global markets that yeah. really matter. And, and that, this really validates that global demand picture, whether it's, again, not just, and it's not just India, China. Western Europe is, is performing exceptionally well. You look at Germany, Sweden, you can go down that list. The, the economic restructuring there and the demand that's emerging there is actually very significant. Back to you, Maria. All right, Bob, thanks very much. Bob and Dylan on the floor of the exchange. Right to Rick Santelli we go. He's in Chicago at the Mercantile Exchange with more on the reaction to the better than expected economic data, as well as the weakness in the dollar. Rick, take it away. Absolutely, and that really is center stage because as you look at a two-day chart of two-year note rates, what you should notice is they're up five basis points from yesterday. Now, granted, that's not a huge amount, but it is rather substantial, and instead of looking at a 459 or maybe close to 450, all of a sudden we're back into the 465, 464 area. Why? Because durable goods was a solid number, and embedded in that, we had durable good orders, non-defense, ex-aircraft proxy for go, uh, uh, capital spending, and it improved. It was up over 4.5% the first up month of the year. We had to go back to December to see that category higher. And even though new home sales disappointed, they were still up, and they negated some of the ill winds from yesterday's existing home sales. Now, if you look at the next chart, this says a lot. Now, granted, stocks aren't dollar-denominated commodities, but in commodities, if, for example, if a dollar moves down 5%, you could look for things like gold, all things being equal, to up 5%. Well, look at this chart combining two months of dollar index losses and S&P gains, and you can see they somewhat negate each other. The weak dollar is definitely a plus for some of those stocks, especially in the S&P 500, as Bob's talked about. But the real question is, if the dollar stabilizes, does that take away some of the vinegar in the stock rally? We'll have to wait and see. Maria, back to you. And I think I left one of my uh, piece of paper on that same table you're sitting at when I left there Monday. Ah, oh, okay. Well, I will uh, I'll look for it, Rick. Thanks so much. Meanwhile, on this record day on Wall Street, we put some perspective on the market's recent run-up. It took over seven years for the Dow Jones Industrial Average to get from 11,000 to 12,000. And yet, it took only 127 trading days for that index to advance another 1,000 points to Dow 13,000. Now, although Alcoa has been the Dow's biggest percentage gainer since the index hit 12,000 last October, it is actually Honeywell that has, in fact, been the most influential 
Dow component on the industrial average. It alone has moved the price weighted index up about 96 points. The top five point gainers rounded out by Boeing, ExxonMobil, IBM, and Altria Group. They have contributed almost 45% of the Dow's total point gains since Dow 12,000. Now, what was the drags on the blue chip index today? A mere 57 points, only four stocks. J&J, &J, General Motors, Pfizer, and the parent company of CNBC, General Electric. Well, the bell has sounded and the market is set. 13,000 now on the books. But more importantly, let's find out where there's money to be made beyond this historic close. Joining me now to talk about that is Kevin Cronin, head of investments for Putnam Investments, and Sam Stovall, chief investment strategist with Standard & Poor's Equity Research. Gentlemen, we thank you for being on the program. Welcome. Happy thank you. to be here. Kevin, of course, 13,000 is just another, another number, right? It's only another 1,000 points in an index with 30 companies. What do you see ahead? How are you positioning yourself? You know, we see uh, 13,000 as an important psychological level. Now that we've had a decisive break from that, uh, we think that the market continues to have upside, given the strong economic growth that we see out there uh, going forward. Uh, the positive earnings surprises and uh, the LBO activity that we think is uh, also fueling some of the valuation uh, changes. Sam, you're obviously studying the fundamentals there, earnings in particular, and the liquidity story has been nothing short of perfect. Is there anything on the horizon that you think upsets that story? Well, actually, Maria, the fundamentals really haven't changed all that much. Yes, we are possibly going to be seeing a 5% increase in earnings this quarter, up from 3%. But that's actually down from the 8% forecast we had seen earlier. Full year results are expected to come in around 6.5%, down from 9.5% forecasted only three months ago. So when you look at the fundamental picture, what really has changed? Have energy prices come down? No, actually they've gone up uh, over the past several weeks. And also what we've seen is that how can you have energy stocks go up and transportation stocks go up the same day? Certainly there is a bit of a disconnect. Also, when the, uh, the concern is that maybe the, uh, the weakness in the dollar might end up seeing a little bit of a turnaround uh, for some strength. So I, I guess the question is, it does seem as if there's too much good stuff in the market right now, and it's really just uh, rushing ahead on hot blood. Ooh, is Sam Stovall getting negative on us? <laughs> Uh, well, just getting a little bit of caution in here. I think that right now, like Robert E. Lee, the market has its blood up, and it's probably going to be edging toward 1527 on the S&P 500, the old-time high. Uh, but I think investors should be a little bit careful because we are heading into a fairly weak pe period in the markets in general, and with not a lot of changes in the fundamental catalysts, uh, I think we could see uh, some digestion of the gains. Kevin, what about that? Sam is sticking his neck out there for us. Why don't you do the same? Tell me what you're doing with your money today. You know, we think that you're going to see a rotation in the marketplace. There's no doubt that so far this year we've seen basic material stocks, energy stocks, utilities, all doing very well. And what we see is a change in leadership uh, coming, and earnings will come from a different place. You know, financial stocks and anything linked to the consumers performed relatively poorly so far this year. And we think that those are the areas that are going to take the market higher as we move into the, uh, the second half. We think that um, you know, some... We think some Go of the ahead, concerns sorry. about subprime uh, are overblown, and while it would definitely be problematic within a small segment of the uh, economy, we don't think it's going to have a broader economic impact. And we think that's one of the things that's been holding uh, consumer and financial stocks back. What's the breakdown of your money right now, Kevin? You know, all day we've been talking so much about the uh, international markets. Uh, being really a, a pretty good opportunity, in particular the emerging markets. You want to be playing the macro themes like financial services or infrastructure that, of course, are benefiting from growth and population growth around the world. U.S. versus international, where are you? You know, we've, we've been overweight international stocks for the last two years. We continue to see uh, positive uh, economic developments, particularly in Europe. We see improvements in uh, Asia. Again, the emerging markets have performed exceptionally well uh, over the course of the last several years. We're a little more cautious on that, um, so we're overweight international, but we're moving from uh, emerging companies, emerging countries to more uh, developed countries. I see. And the developed countries being what? Japan, Europe, what? Uh, Japan, uh, Germany, you know, obviously the DAX has had a, a pretty uh, good start to the year. It's up about 15% uh, so far this year. So, um, you know, uh, we, we find opportunities kind of across Europe and in, uh, in Japan in particular. Sam, tell me about that. If you're going to be taking some chips off the table in U.S. stocks, being a little more cautious, watching this market as it runs up, even though nothing has changed fundamentally, do you want to be placing bets internationally? 
Um, you're probably putting words in my mouth, but the answer is yes. Actually, our investment policy committee has uh, an underweight recommendation, about 40 percent exposure to U.S. versus 45 benchmark, but a 25 percent recommended exposure to international versus 15 benchmark. We're, overall, we're looking for about a 6 percent uh, decline in the U.S. dollar this year. That'll add currency translation tailwind. Also, we're expecting to see better earnings growth, and we do see more attractive valuations overseas than uh, as compared with the U.S. Let's talk uh, groups, Sam. Of course, the financial services uh, very much in focus here. With all the deals that we're seeing, we've got a story coming up right after this interview about this blockbuster battle going on for ABN AMRO. Do you want to own financials? What's your take in terms of sector allocation? Uh, yes, you do want to own financials, in our opinion. You also want to own consumer staples and health care, and I think it's really an earnings story. Last year, we saw earnings increase 15 percent on the S&P 500. This time around, you want clarity, you want consistency, and you want quality. And so I think with health care, you're going to see uh, almost a tripling of earnings growth in this sector as compared with the S&P 500. Also good uh, earnings growth in the staples category, and I think the financials were beaten up to the point where many of the banks offer for a yield that rivals that on the 10-year note, not just the S&P 500. Kevin, really quick, what do I sell right here? What does your gut tell me to avoid? Um, we think that the energy stocks and uh, some of the utility stocks have had a, um, a very strong run here, and that's where we're taking some of the uh, chips off the table and allocating it to more consumer yeah. and financials. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. Thanks so much. Thank You're you. Welcome. We appreciate it. We'll talk with you soon. Thank you. Meanwhile, I just mentioned it a moment ago, a blockbuster buyout battle heats up in the banking sector. This is some story, a group including Royal Bank of Scotland, Spain's Banco Santander, and Belgium's Fortis Group. Good economic numbers today, helping the Dow break into uncharted territory. The blue chip index scaling that 13,000 mark for the first time ever. Strong demand for big ticket items fueling the rally. But not everybody is so impressed. Find out what's threatening the U.S. economy and where the best opportunities are around the world. More expert analysis from Don Strasheim and Brian Fabry, my guests, when they join me for our in-depth coverage of this market milestone. What's happening to home prices and the tightening of credit for mortgage lending, it has to have an effect. And that's Eli Broad. Yes, he would know. He founded one of the largest home building companies in the country. See where this billionaire builder is putting his money today, now that the housing market has weakened. Plus, Apple stock under pressure after the closing bell tonight. Take a look. The stock up 2% ahead of the company's latest earnings. They are due any moment. We will have the results. Instant analysis as soon as they're released. Take a look at the big board's top percentage gainers today. Here is what was winning on Wall Street. You're watching Closing Bell on CNBC. First in business worldwide.